the UK's chief scientific advisor, who joins us from Westminster. Good morning to you. I mean, the big question here is why the advice that is being given to our government does seem to be different to the advice being given to many other governments who are taking much more stringent action. Well, we've got a, a, a panel of, of very uh, world-leading scientists across um, epidemiology, mathematical modelling, virology, clinicians, and we're taking uh, input from uh, leading academics to come, try and come up with a plan that actually does what we want it to do. And it doesn't mean that the others are doing something wrong. And in fact, much of the advice and much of the actions, if you look at them, they're trying to achieve the same thing. And that is to try to reduce the peak of the epidemic, flatten it and broaden it so that you don't end up with so much intense pressure on healthcare systems at one time. So that's one aim, is to reduce transmission, try to make sure that we end up with a broader epidemic, not a very sharp one that overloads the system. And the second, of course, is to protect the elderly and vulnerable and to make sure that during that peak, they are protected as well as you can, because that's the group that stand the biggest chance of having a, a serious outcome from this. But many people are asking the question, and it has to be legitimate, as to why, if you're trying to delay the spread of the virus, and people can understand why you would want to do that, why we basically seem to be allowing society to continue as normal. You know, there's no lockdowns, there's no shutdowns of schools or education facilities, there's still people going to restaurants and the theatre. Isn't that actually being going to be problematic in terms of trying to delay the spread of the virus? So the, the UK has actually done a good job of contact tracing and isolating. So the first phase of this means that we have a little bit behind we, in terms of where the outbreak is compared to others. And the measures that were announced, which is about self-isolation, even if you've got very mild symptoms, will mean a large number of people actually at home being isolated because of this uh, infection. That's a very big measure, actually. It's going to have quite a big impact across a number of households, a number of people. So I don't think that's a, a trivial measure at all. And all the modelling suggests that these sorts of measures and the other two that we discussed yesterday, the ones that have the biggest impact. There are other things which, uh, you're quite right, are things that do have some effect and, 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 and come in at the right time. And mass gatherings is the one that keeps coming up. And mass gatherings, of course, are a place where you can potentially get infection from somebody. But the alternative is also important that if you're not at a mass gathering, you're at a small gathering. And most of the transmission of these types of viruses occur in small gatherings, not in big gatherings. Uh, and therefore, this concentration on getting people who've got symptoms into their house isolated, potentially the next step to ask households to do it so you contain the whole thing in a household and making sure we protect the vulnerable and elderly are the first three things we need to do. It doesn't, of course, stop the possibility that even re relatively soon you need to do more than that. But getting this right and making sure that we can monitor the outbreak is absolutely key. Uh, you, you talk about the modelling. Jeremy Hunt, the former health secretary last night, was talking about the modelling, saying he would like to see the modelling, particularly the, beh the behavioural science which he seemed to imply was taking some sort of precedence over the epidemiology. Oh, I don't think that's correct. I mean, I, th I think the modelling and the behavioural science and the clinical input come together. Um, it's not absolutely not the case that behavioural science takes um, the predominance, but of course it's an important consideration. And uh, it is uh, the case, of course, that if you completely locked down absolutely everything, probably for a period of four months or more, then you would suppress this virus. All of the evidence from previous epidemics suggests that when you do that and then you release it, it all comes back again. So the other part of this is to make sure that we don't end up with a sudden peak again in the winter, which is even larger, which causes even more problems. So we want to suppress it, not get rid of it completely, which you can't do anyway, not suppress it so we get the second peak, and also allow enough, enough of us who are going to get mild illness to become immune to this, to help with the sort of whole population response which would protect everybody. Yeah, I mean, that, that herd immunity, I know you talked about yesterday when you were appearing with the Prime Minister. In, in terms of building up a herd immunity within the UK, what, I mean, what sort of percentage of people 
need to have contracted the virus? Probably about 60% or so. And uh, we think that this virus is likely to be one that comes back year on year, become like a seasonal virus, and communities will become immune to it. And that's going to be an important part of controlling this longer term. 60%? 60% is the sort of figure you need to get herd, herd I mean, immunity. I mean, even with that, even looking at the sort of the best case scenario, I know we were talking last week and you were saying, you know, half of 1% to 1% fatality in something like this, th that's an awful lot of people dying in this country. Well, I mean, of course, we do face the prospect of, of as the Prime Minister said yesterday, of uh, an increasing number of people dying. That is a real prospect. This is a nasty disease. For most people, it's a mild disease. It's important to know we don't know yet, nobody knows, what proportion of people have this who are completely asymptomatic. So the only cases that we've really got at the moment are people who've had symptoms, or largely people who've had symptoms. That means that even estimating exactly what the uh, um, uh, death rate is from this is quite difficult because there may be many more people that haven't been uh, detected yet. And that's why some of the new tests that are being developed now are going to be so important so we can really understand how this disease is spreading. And we don't in, have a handle on that yet. It, in, in terms of of our response to this. A couple of points I want to put to you. One, the former Prime Minister of Italy was talking to Sky News yesterday. You said yesterday we're about four weeks behind Italy. Don't we want to avoid being like Italy? And their former Prime Minister is saying, don't repeat our mistakes, don't waste time. Yes, should, we I, not, should we not heed some of that advice? I think, I think my comments about being behind Italy are about where we were on, on the, the unmitigated curve of the epidemic. We've been working on this since the beginning of January. So this isn't something that suddenly groups have come together to think about yesterday. This is a, a group of people that have been working very hard on this, giving advice over the whole time. What we don't want to do is to get into knee-jerk reactions where you have to start doing measures at the wrong pace because something's happened. So we're trying to keep ahead of it. We're trying to lay out the path so people can see what the actions are that are being advised. And then, of course, it's up to ministers to decide which of those actions are the most appropriate to take. So I completely agree with the Prime Minister of Italy. You do not want to be caught on the back foot on this. Uh, Professor, Professor John Ashton, who I'm, I'm sure you know, former Director of Public Health England for the North West region, he, he said the response so far has been wooden and academic. Well, I think John will have his views on this, uh, and they're perfectly legitimate. Lots of people have got views on this. Um, I, I think that uh, what we're trying to do is feed in the most uh, up-to-date and relevant advice we can to enable sensible decisions to be made at the right time. And, of course, during this sort of thing, there are lots of people, lots of different voices coming from all sorts of angles. And if you listen to all of them, they are largely mutually incompatible so it's impossible to keep everybody happy with any response you do and we, that's why we're trying to base it on the best possible advice and actually the whole point is that this is very practical advice based on the science not something that actually is meant to be an academic exercise at all oh so patrick you have the advantage of not being a politician um although i know you don't get to have the final say in all of this but are, are you prepared if this changes if, if you look back at this in a week and say, do you know what, this hasn't been the right action, how flexible are you prepared to be in changing your position and your advice to the government? Absolutely, I will base it on the evidence. Um, and my job as Chief Scientific Advisor is to, is to speak scientific truth to power and say it as it is, and that's exactly what I will do.